Thank you. So I, uh, Molly Rogers, and I'm the chair of the Juvenile Justice Subcommittee. And so I am going to call our meeting to order. And um, Joy, will you just um, do a quick roll call? Um, just so we are able, so everybody's familiar with who's here. Thank you, Molly. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to call out the name of the members and just say present or say yes. Um, so first on the list is Andy Leonard. Next is Tabiti Lewis. Adrian Livingston, she's not going to be here today. Christina McMahon. Present. Thank you. Raphael Miller. Here. Thank you. Yeah. Molly Rogers. I am here. Thank you, Molly. Kiwi Wilson. Sam Cole. Sam is here. Thank you, Sam. Maricela Otega Guzman. She said she uh she isn't available on Mondays, so we might not be seeing her for a bit, but she's not gonna make it to today's meeting. And I think that's it. Back to you, Molly. Thank you. I think that will be one of our conversations um, at the end under other business is um, trying to set up a time where people are able, because we now have three members with standing um, conflicts with this meeting. And so I think that will be something that we'll kind of take a look at. Um, Anya, I see that Cord is is on here or he, um, so I'm not sure how you want to take the lead on that, but it's the 2325 JCP allocations. Oh, I will just say a couple of words and then I will ask Cord to share what we're proposing with you. So the new biennium started on July 1, 2023. And we needed to, needed to establish new JCP grant amounts and most importantly, minimum grant allocation because that's the responsibility of the council to uh, approve that amount. So we've received a bit of an increase with the service level increase for the, the well, now it's current biennium in JCP funding. So Ford did his magic recalculating um, was the, 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 the core in our calculation was to make sure that the minimum grant gets a reasonable increase so and the rest was divided and court has a much better way of explaining how his mathematical thinking was at work court could you help us sure happily um good afternoon uh members of the committee court buker youth development division deputy director for the record um, yes, yeah, so we used the, the methodology is really similar to what we did for 2021-23. So, um, you know, the the formula counties, those that have allocations that are calculated based on um, population, uh, you know, you'll see at the top of the list here before the division. And so those are calculated based on um, population numbers, the same ones that OIA uses for their formula grants. Um, it's actually 2021 population estimates. Um, and those, you know, we used 2019 in the previous biennium. So we're essentially, you know, using the, the latest data that OIA is using. Um, and then all of the um, new proposed allocations here, um, all, all are increases from the previous biennium. In the counties where the estimated population dropped, that increase is smaller than in counties where where the population of youth zero to seventeen um, was was seen to increase, um, the the increase was a little under one percent in the counties that had big drops in population. Um, so you'll see, like you know, the largest counties, Multnomah County, Washington County, both actually had 
um, just several thousand, you know, fewer youth showing up in the, the count this, this, um, in this year, for example. So their increase is a little smaller than, um, a county like, um, in, uh, Clackamas County, which grew or, um, Klamath, which was the, the, the county that actually had the largest increase in estimated population of youth zero to 17 in the data we use. So, so the goal was for all formula counties to see an increase, but to, to taper the increases so that we also don't have any county that has a larger, um, population, but smaller allocation than another county. So, you know, if a county has several counties have around 20,000 to 22,000 youth in this area and their allocations are graduated. So they're not, you're not, you know, you're getting the, you know, a, a fair um, amount per youth. Then the, you can see on the chart, there's a cutoff. So the, as Anya said, one of the goals with our increase, which is I think around a, a 3% increase in funding, it's just the current service level increase. Um, we use that um, in large part to um, bring the minimum grants up to 70,000. Um, we felt like that amount was a little bit more, but probably gives those counties more of an opportunity to do something significant with those funds. So you can see in this table that all the minimum counties are at 70. And then, you know, you, you, um, you can see where the formula counties start. Uh, and that's that's basically it. So the you know the the goals, the things that really guide this are you know we look at the previous biennium. So you know we're trying not to we don't want to do any reductions in any allocations. Um, so we just have adjusted the increases based on the growth in population and where the population dropped. We've just had a smaller increase in funds in the formula counties, um, but everyone's seeing an increase, and in particular the minimum grant counties. You know, here we'd see about an eleven and a half percent increase. And that's that's basically it. I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, Court, when you say population increase, do you mean census data, or do you mean the number of kids the juvenile department is serving? It's based on census data. So the um, so the data we use is, is census data. The Population Research Center at Portland State. Um, you know, does these, you know, demographic breakdowns and that's been what OA has used. And so um, that's what we've used as well, just so that we're in alignment with them, you know, since these are similar grants. Great. Are there any um, other questions? Okay, let me see if I'm going to see if I can. Perfect. I just want to add to what Court was sharing. The minimum grant allocation applies to counties and all nine federally recognized tribes as well. So I just um, add a clarification. When was the last time that the minimum grants were increased? Was that four years ago or six years ago? Uh, it was two years ago. Did we go up to 60, from 61, from 60 to 63,000? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, I believe it was, it was like 45 back in 2017 yeah. and then, then it went up to 60 and then 63. Right. Okay. Other questions? So I'm going to open it up for questions from non-members. If they, if there are any questions from the group. Hey Molly, this is Brian. I was just yeah. wondering. This is more of a question for Anya, or just interested if we got any um, sort of basic information from OIA about their how their formula funds, their basic and diversion funds are going to look. In the so, um, and maybe you covered that and I was yeah. late. So apologies. No, no I, I can I can do an update on that though, though I probably I mean I can let Anya and Cord if they want to jump in as well. But um both uh the diversion and basic, there are no minimum grants. And so it is based strictly on the formula for that. So for example, I think um Sherman County gets eighteen hundred dollars a year it's just strictly formula it's strictly formula no minimum grant 
strictly strictly formula based on strictly on the population percentages that the PSU population. So it's it's just on population. Mm -hmm. uh, JCP basic has another component to it, doesn't it, Tori? Isn't it also crime rate? Or Christina? I'm not sure that it is. I think it's just based on population. Okay. Yeah, so, so we use the same population numbers as OYA was using, but we did not use their amounts because it's a different sort of um, yeah. distribution. Yeah, I get that. Do Just maybe for Molly and Tori and Christina, because it's youth population, do, does the does the amount change from biennium to biennium? Yes. Yeah. So like Multnomah County, I was I was talking with Kyla. They took a reduction because of that population dip. It's usually not huge though. Huge. I mean, it, it'll go up and down, but it usually isn't. Like Christina, your your yes. deficit isn't something you're like, oh my gosh, that's a huge cut that I'm going to take, right? No, I well, mean we don't usually um, yeah. have major population, but I think Multnomah was they're not used to having a reduction at all, so this was a little unusual this year. Yeah. In the numbers of population, because they're actually dollars. Oh yeah, they actually did do it was, yeah. Yeah. Is it possible, or Anya, you're probably already going to do this, but I think it would be helpful um, to send that that um, chart out to um, the juvenile directors. I'll be happy to, as once we got a confirmation from this group that the minimum yeah. grant allocation is agreeable with you. Right. Yeah. So I... Uh... Uh, I want to be really thoughtful um, in this and super appreciate the um, lift of the minimum grant counties. Um, uh, I am one, and so I want to really be thoughtful as I say this, um, that um, I had not anticipated the increase at the level it is, but what I do know is that um, even if we put, even if there was a reduction of a little bit in the minimum grant counties, it doesn't change the overall number for the larger counties that much, I think. Does that make sense? So $7,000 is a significant increase um, for the small counties at 11% and the tribes. Um, Did you run the numbers with any other with any other percentage? Gord? Um I, you know when I was when I was playing with the numbers, I did initially look at um I think sixty five thousand. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I, I was like, I think let me let me try this at seventy and see whether it kind of allows us to, how it allows us to move the large counties up. And we felt like these were still pretty good pretty numbers. good funding levels for folks. Yeah, that's what my point is, is I think that it doesn't change the overall pot that much. No, because it's like, you know, if you if you take 2000 away, that's only like 40 or $50,000 more that's yeah. going into split among large counties. That's what I think I wanted to just that it, while it looks like an 11% is a lift, it doesn't really change the big numbers that much. Maybe like a 0.2% or 0.3%. Yeah, Same no, that's absolutely right. Yeah, we, you know, I, I'm, I, I think I, can, I get what you're driving at, and yeah, like we felt like this level work would we would feel comfortable with how this affects everybody in a positive way. That's my point. That's right. Thank you. You said it much better than I did. Uh, Sam, you have a question. Um, thank you, Molly. So, Cord, you know the funds available? Is it biennial or annual? These are biennial funds. This is the total okay. for the two years. And then, so then for the two years, is it going to be like, for instance, like um, we normally go like 48% year one and 50% year in year two. So like, would, would they see an increase bump in year two? Because we always increase year two because um, 
you know, cost of living increases and it, cost of business, you know, doing business increases. So even though we get like, if we get like, like, let's say a hundred dollars, we, we allocate 48 year one and 52 in year two. So, but then you're no. just, it's just going to be even. Year it one. is even. Yeah. Because we just make the allocation for the biennium. Um, but certainly the recipient can budget it in a way where if they, they kind of want to do like a, 48 52 split and how they're spending i think we often i mean anya you could confirm this but my sense is that across ydd grants like in the competitive side as well most of the time folks spend more in year two than year one so you know the grantees kind of have the option for the the, the rate of spending over the two years and i think most most recipients of our funds tend to spend more in the second year and also some some these are reimbursement based budgets sometimes people spend more money in one quarter and less than another it depends on the type of services provided number of kids served and all kind of multiple variations of that happen locally and of course what i see with my grantees what they do is even though we tell them 40 percent 52 in year one they will save like three or five percent in reserve just in case year two's funding is not, you know, and then that's why. And then, and then year two, once they know their allocation for you too, then they really start, you know. I'm just saying that's that's the behavior I've seen. I don't know if you guys seen that. I see a little of that. I mean, I think it varies. I think sometimes programs also have, you know, for, for the two year grants, uh, you know, the, the competitive grants where an organization is getting a grant and then trying to hire. I think a lot of times the startup is slow and so folks just naturally spend more later. Um, I don't know, as, as I'm not as familiar with spending patterns in these grants, but um, there, there was one or actually two other things I should share about this. Um, one is that uh, this these numbers are based on the final budget numbers that we saw. The, the, the total is the final total for JCP funds in our 23-25 budget. Um, but ODE is doing their final reconciliation of all the budget numbers with the legislature. So they've, they've told me these numbers are not final until they're final, final, final. Um, so they would not change probably more than by a few dollars. They've never changed before from what is in the budget. We're pretty small compared to ODE as a whole. I think that reconciliation matters more when you're dealing with like a billion dollars than with this particular grant. Um, but we should probably have a caveat when we share this, that these are the proposed numbers are not final yet, um, but in all likelihood, these would be the final numbers if the minimum grant is, is accepted by the committee. Um, and the other thing I would say is I just had a conversation with procurement about the, so they're working on extending the grant agreements that were in place. I know some folks got extensions done, some were still on hold, but I did just confirm that they're, um, they basically said, go ahead and give us the, the, you know, we can do the amendment to add funds for the new biennium along with the other extensions that are left over so we can actually get the grant agreement um, amendments moving pretty quickly once this is finalized. That's awesome. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I appreciate all the hard work. I know it's always this just interesting dance to get to the end right after the biennium is done. Um, and so really appreciate that. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of go for consensus to move this forward. I'm seeing heads nod. And so Anya, I think we move it forward with consensus from this group. Wonderful. Thank you, Malin. Court, thank you so much again for putting all this work into it. Sure. Um, Anya, I was going to maybe make a quick comment about oh, our our legislation, and then if, if oh, I may, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, sure. I'll depart the meeting unless you need me for any other sections. We're going to stay as long as you like, but you can, yeah, sharing information would be wonderful. All right, great. Well, um, I just wanted to share with folks here that, um, as, as you, you may know, our, our House Bill 2372, those were the statutory updates passed. Um, that, that happened in the last few days of the legislative session. So um, it's pretty exciting because we didn't know that was if it was going to happen or not. Um, but the impact here is that the, the tribal JCP grants will now be in statute. This will be a standard you know, thing that is part of our process, as well as some of the clarifications around the 
um, approval of plans, you know, so that, and, and that, you know, there's a process for counties to opt out if they ever choose to. Um, so uh, as far as implementation goes, I think a lot of bill implementation will really be more in the context of um, strategic planning, you know, which will be coming um, in the, the fall, winter, and the year ahead. Um, so we'll talk more about it then, but just to kind of note that, you know, the impacts of that legislation passing here, you know, particularly around the JCP plan are really positive. Um, the law goes into effect January 1, so it's not technically law yet, um, but as, as we've been doing the tribal grants um, probably since the council was formed, um, this just, you know, allows us to do so in, in perpetuity really, you know, without any question of whether it's, um, you know, you know, it's in law. So uh, I appreciate everyone's input, particularly Molly and, and Tori, I know you both were really helpful in that process. So thank you again. And uh, with that, I will answer any questions about the bill. Otherwise, I'm going to hop off. No, I really appreciate it. And it feels um, truly like it is inclusive now with the tribal identified and statutorily included in it. So while it's been done in the past, it just kind of solidifies it. Welcome yeah, to me. feel really good about it. Yeah. Thanks, Molly. Anything else for CORE? Okay. Thanks, CORE. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is the 2022 uh, RED Draft Data Analysis and Reduction Plan. Hello, everyone. So, um... Um, I and myself have been working on the uh, RED uh, reduction plan and the uh, the data analysis on it. Um, what you see in front of you is is the uh, the numerical numbers that we received uh, from JGIS uh, uh, Juvenile Justice Information System, and and it's a comparison as to um, 2022 and 2021. Um, we use this information basically to formulate our, our RED plan. Uh, we look at it to see where we have some um, issues or some successes as well. Um, and we compare it to last year's um, data um, to see if we've made improvements or where we need to make improvements. Um, basically, it's, um, it's um, designed to uh, capture the the uh, youth population um, from ages 10 to 17 of all race and uh, ethnic demographics. So if you look at the very top uh, table, um, that's year 2022, uh, the bottom table was year, fiscal year 2021. Um, and we'll do a comparison. So if you look at the highlighted yellow, um, you'll see the total population of white, white, black, Hispanic, American, uh, Indian, and Asian are on the top. And the uh, decision points are on the left side going down, the population, uh, referral, diversion, retrial, secure adult transfer. If you look at um, the white population, it's uh, 264, 643,000 youth. Of that group, if you go down one, 3,587. Um, entered into the juvenile justice system or were referred to the juvenile justice system. The percentage is basically 1.36. Uh, we take the percentage of, of the total population, but everything from that point on um, is predicated on the referral number. So the 3,587. So of that 3,587, 2,750 um, were deferred, or 76.67%. Of that 3,587 who were referred to the juvenile justice system, 34% um, or 1,240 faced detention. Um, and we go down so forth like that. Does anyone have any questions concerning that? So when we look at the highlighted yellow at the very top table, um, we see that uh, um, 3,587 white youth were referred to the uh, juvenile justice system. If you look over into the next column, black, 
Um, there was 569 Hispanic, uh, 1,494 American Indian, um, 166 Asian, 127. So basically the percentage um, for, for white was 1.36%, black was 3.94%, uh, Hispanic, 1.65, American Native, uh, American Indian, um, Native American, 2.87, and Asian, uh, 0.56. So what that tells us is, um, one, compared to 2021, um, more youth experience a referral this year than they did last year. So we have more youth coming into our juvenile justice system um, as opposed to last year. Now we have to take that into context also. Um, 2021 was the year that we were um, coming out of COVID. So there wasn't a lot of movement. There wasn't a lot of activity. So if the numbers are higher this year, we have to take into context. We've been removed from, uh, um, we had been removed from COVID for about two years. So there was more activity. So it's fair to say that there probably would have been more contact. Um, so there are more referral numbers. Um, but what, what, what's disturbing about the referral numbers is uh, Black youth still are roughly two and a half times more likely to be referred. Um, American Indian and Native American youth are roughly one and a half times more likely to be referred. Um, so, so that's the concern um, at the referral point. Um, there's still disparities um, in um, certain categories of, of race and ethnicity as to who gets referred um, to the juvenile justice system. Um, the diversion point, this is where we won. Um, as compared to last year, um, overall, our numbers are up 30%. Um, for uh, the use of diversion. And that's across the board. Um, that's in every ethnic and racial category. Uh, that's huge because um, when you have a 30% increase um, in the amount of people who are, amount of youth who are um, being diverted out of a system, those are children, those are youth who are not being um, subjected to further and deeper penetration or movement into the system. So it allows them an opportunity to remove themselves from the system and have success in, in their youth life into their adulthood. Um, so that's where the win is. Um, in, this, in this diversion area, um, the largest group that, that benefited from this was Hispanics or uh, Latinx, or Latinx. Um, they had a 78.65% uh, percentage rate of, of being deferred. Um, and, and that's wonderful for um, a group of color um, to, to have um, exceeded um, that as opposed to um, what we're basing it off of, or what we're comparing it to. Um, like I said, 30% increase from last year, um, huge. So with that, um, the pretrial detention rates were less um, because we are using more um, diversion. Um, and also secure, con secure uh, confinement um, those numbers were less also. Although we had more referrals, we had less children um, facing secure confinement. Um, basically, we cut that in half uh, percentage-wise. Uh, in 2021, um, I believe uh, uh, um, Blacks, Black youth were 7.35% uh, of that population to, to uh, experience secure confinement. That number dropped to 4.22%. Uh, um, if you look at um, uh, American Indian, um, they were up at about 12 and a half, a little bit more than 12 and a half percent in 2021. In 2022, um, they're, they're down to 6.65%. So we've cut the amount of uh, secure confinement for our youth literally in half even though we have more referrals. Um, so that's a win. Uh, but again, however, um, the numbers um, are still disparate in the fact that um, um, Black and uh, Hispanic, Latinx, 
um, and, in, and in particular, um, American Indian, Native American, are still um, one to four times more likely to experience secure um, confinement as opposed to white youth. Um, and these are these are some of the smaller populations with the highest number um, of likelihood to experience the harshest amount of punishment. Um, so, so overall, basically, um, we've made some strides in the use of our diversion. We've kept a lot of children out um, of the deeper end of the justice system. That that is wonderful. Um, overall, we've we've um, we've we've helped um, one particular um, ethnic group um, surpass um, our comparison to white youth um, in diversion in pretrial detention. Um, that's a success. That's wonderful. Um, we still have some work to do in who we refer. Um, we still have some work to do um, in who we detain as well as who experiences secure confinement um, as compared to last year. Um, so we're making progress. Um, we're doing well. Um, we're, we're, we're cutting some things in half. Um, we're utilizing the tools that we have available to protect our youth from going further into uh, the juvenile justice system. But there's still some disparities and there's disproportionality at some of the decision points um, when in terms of, of race and ethnicity. Um, and, and so we need to focus a little bit more on that, um, continue to get those numbers down um, and, and focus on the race and ethnicity as to who gets what. Um, and I think Oregon and, and the youth that we serve uh, will be, we be well off. So, so based on this information, um, the juvenile justice team, the juvenile crime prevention justice team, uh, are, are are looking at the areas, the, the decision points as to to where we need to focus on what we've done well. Um, let's not let's not minimize the things that we've done well. We've done some great things this year, and um, we need to highlight those, and we need to build off of that to continue to have success, not only in that area, but as an extension into other areas. What did we do well that we can apply to something else? So we're looking at that those decision points. And we're also looking at the decision points um, um, that cause us concern. Um, what avenues that we need to do for that? Um, how do we how do we uh, rectify that? How do we bring those numbers down? How do we address that? How would, do we provide technical assistance and, and awareness and training in those areas as well? So this this these data tables um, allow us to 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 formulate that plan. Um, and again, that's what I and, and, and our team has been doing. Um, it's in draft mode right now, but we've uh, we put some um, some real effort into um, coming up with something really uh, uh, formidable in, into combating some of the issues that we have, as well as um, uh, progressing some of the uh, the successes that we've experienced as well. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question if I can. Yes. Lawrence, thank you. Hey, um, you know, one of the things that I've always struggled with a little bit around the data is um, like we don't, I don't get to control the referrals that come to me from law enforcement. Um, those show up, I get, a, you know, I get the report usually a day or two after that's even occurred, the events occurred. Um, what are your thoughts around outreach to law enforcement agencies around education, um, you know, around that referral process and maybe the diversion process that juvenile departments are doing? Is that something that you're looking at or thinking about as far as how how we can affect some additional change in the system? Um, thank you for that question. Absolutely. We have um, looked at that. Um, again, um, we, we've just come out of um, a pandemic, so... Um, prior to my arrival, um, that work was actually being done. We're trying to initiate that work and being done. Um, so there was a pause and a lot of um, um, the, the availability of, of, of things like that to, to occur. So yes, um, law enforcement, it's, it's, it's very important for us to reach out to them and to explain to them um, just the adolescent mind, um, how that works and, and how um, you know some of the things that may have um, occurred may not necessarily um, need a referral. It may need um, a, a diversion. And there are other community-based programs out there that they can um, bring them to. And if there aren't, um, you know, we can 
certainly as a state, uh, you know, come up with something that that could provide that sort of of, of outlet uh, to prevent some of our our youth from you know entering the juvenile justice system. So not only law enforcement, but you know, also the school system, you know, and the discipline that that takes place um, you know, on those grounds, the uh, suspensions and, and the disciplines that happen um, sometimes um, end up at the uh, doorsteps of the juvenile justice system as well. So um, law enforcement, yes, school systems, any, uh, any agency that has contact with youth that could refer them, we would most certainly like to um, provide technical assistance, training, understanding, um, all those things are ref in reference to uh, race and ethnicity and how that affects um, the referral rates of the juvenile justice system here in Oregon. Great. Tabidi, uh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Hey, Lawrence, thank you. Uh, and Anya, this is uh, really uh, great. I like the way uh, you've outlined this. And um, I like what uh, the... the uh, whoever was previously making comments about these intersections with law enforcement. Uh, I am too, I'm gonna to make a uh, two questions or comment and a question. Um, so one, I, I think this, this idea, you know, just working in uh, middle schools, high schools, uh, and heck, I think even no matter what the space is, but particularly with youth, it's very been well documented that uh, non-white youth are not seen as youth, but as adults, right? Or situated or criminalized. And so this data is great for conversations with uh, school uh, vice principals and principals, teachers, as well as with uh, uh, individuals in law enforcement spaces to really just look at the data and then have a qualitative and, and uh, kind of a critical race conversation with them around, you know, this is not um, anecdotal evidence, but this is this is the evidence right here, right? Two to three times based on race and ethnicity. Um, so uh, I would, I, I'm happy to help in any way with that kind of work because you guys have done some great work with this, uh, with quantitative uh, uh, data. Uh, the, the, the other question is, as you pointed out, uh, these numbers suggest, particularly for the uh, among the Hispanic and and the Native American, we all. So first of all, great, there's a change, but I'm wondering what's really working well. Um, and and I know you, it sounds like you said your report is going to tease that out, but that's what I'm really curious about is what's working well. And I know it can't be a one size may not be a one size fits all for what's working well in each category, but I'm really curious as to okay, what, what really happened among the Latinx uh, youth that made this push uh, that differed from, you know, American Indian, Black? Uh, so, okay. Uh, great. Those are great comments. I, um, Chris, I'll have a comment at the end. Christina? I just wanted to respond to Tori's suggestion about um, reaching out to the law enforcement community. Um, I know in our little teeny corner of the world here, uh, about a year and a half ago, we did a train the trainers event with Strategies for Youth, which is a national organization. They're based out of the Boston area, and they focus on uh, providing training to law enforcement related to young people um, as a way of diverting. Really, part of their mission is they're trying to divert kids who don't need to be sucked into the juvenile justice system from being sucked into the juvenile justice system. So um, we had them come out and do a train the trainer, trained a multidisciplinary team, which consists of members of law enforcement, juvenile department people, uh, people from behavioral health, uh, people of um, from community-based organizations. <laughs> And it also incorporates including young people in uh, part of the two day curriculum is having a, a section where they actually get to sit down and talk with kids. And um, even though we, it's very small numbers because we only have done a few of these sessions, there's one coming up sometime this fall. Um, so it's only in Clackamas County right now. We're the only jurisdiction that has done this training with strategies for youth, but the comments from the officers who are going through the training, it has been 
major eye-opening moment. So the reason, because um, the training covers things like um, how most kids have uh, that are involved in our system have pretty extensive trauma histories. Not you can't say that about every kid, but in general, a higher proportionality of that. Um, talking about racial, we we share the numbers in Clackamas County as part of the training of the disparities that we're seeing in our community, and which is pretty eye opening. And then there are several folks who are. Uh, representatives of different historically marginalized groups who are part of the training team. So the reason I'm bringing this up is I think it would be great if we could do outreach. When I say we, part of this committee, part of the work of y YDO, I'm getting used to that, um, to the training academy, DPSST, that does training for law enforcement, um, I think a lot of you know, I changed careers. I used to be a juvenile court prosecutor. The training that police officers get in the state of Oregon when it comes to dealing with young people is abysmal. It's terrible. So, uh, and I'm not, I'm not getting commissions from Strategies for Youth. I'm saying that something like this would be a good thing to um, try to focus on as a strategy to try to move the dial. I think they've been endorsed actually by the International uh, Police Chiefs Association. Brian, I know you're familiar. You might've written an article for their journal at one time. Um, so they have, they have some um, street cred with the law enforcement community. So um, I'm not saying we uh, have to use them, but I'm saying something like that, if there was ever an opportunity to try to convince the people that run uh, the academy here that trains law enforcement that this is a very important, valuable part of training that should happen across the board. It shouldn't be, you know, half an hour dedicated to juvenile justice. I don't know what they're up to now. Maybe they might be up to four hours. This training that we do is a two-day, all-day training for police officers. So um, anyway, I'm happy, Lawrence, if you're interested in talking to my manager who oversees and coordinates this, um, happy to share whatever as you're um, starting down this road. Um, but anyway, actually, I just wanted to share that with the group. Actually, Oregon got to um, honor that presentation back at CJJ um, Strategies for Youth did um, a presentation and Alice did it. Uh, presentation for Oregon. So I also think though, uh, Tori, that's the reason that we ask LIPSIX to take a look at our data and our plans. Um, and I know each county has a different role in that, but that really is um, uh, a, another venue that we should be able to take this data back to, um, is to our LIPSIX to have those kind of conversations. Cause I know each community is, is different. Um, we're getting ready to do a group through our experts, through the University of Chicago, um, a training for law enforcement here in Wasco and Sherman County on how to interact with youth and um, kind of the kind of the same model as Clackamas County is using, just a little slightly different from a different university, but the same concept. Um, and so I think that that is something that we can encourage to be put into the different plans. But I think Tabidi, you're also very right that. Um, education can be one of those components that feeds the system. Um, and the other part is in the probation reform is taking and looking at the data through this lens um, is a statewide data, but also it would be great if we were able to potentially work with OIA to have this report be one of those reports that we can just kind of click on for statewide for us to look at, but also then tease out for our, our counties. Um, because in looking at, at just one county, in my county, um, the numbers have not been very good the last two years. It's been, um, there must be another county that's doing better than us because our, ours is not. And so being able to tease that out for our own story and our own conversation would be really helpful. Um, and so if we could get the formulas put into the, to the magic that that happens in the background, that would be amazing for the individual counties to then have a conversation. Um, and then also being able to have access to Lawrence and Anya and 
um, to come talk to the stories locally with our lipstick. So it's not just the juvenile director that's sometimes presenting it. Sometimes it's really helpful to have um, someone from the state come have a conversation with us too. And it, to BD, if you're a as a member of the juvenile justice subcommittee, that may be amazing to, you have such a busy schedule, but potentially zoom you in for conversations with our local law enforcement would be amazing. So as we kind of work through this, coming up with a playbook would be a good idea. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, everyone. So um, a couple of things. Well, for once, thank you so much. So in this conversation today, we came up with a few strategies. One, connecting with law enforcement and considering trading options through PTSD. Did I say PTSD? It sounds like a, <laughs> a post-traumatic stress disorder. Hope that that conversation will not lead to that. And also through reaching out to LIPSIX and second, I don't want to lose track that Tibiri is proposing, talking to school administrators, teachers on middle and high school discipline and treating kids as kids as they should. So all of these are wonderful things. I'll say one more thing and then I'll say something like different, <laughs> not against from what I just said, but from a different opera. So uh, the data that Lawrence shared with you this is a new approach that ojdp is now requiring us to organize data and look at comparisons so this is not what you usually well what you've been used to it's not the rri methodology but they're not like against each other you'll still see similarities because we're using the same raw data just they just arranged in a different format but RRI reports exist for each county. So we could uh, organize the data in, a, in this format for each for the county that might be interested in this type of uh, information in addition to existing RRI, but it, it's always a possibility. Now, Lawrence, I'm going to start it, but then you will continue. So this is like the saddest moment of this year for me, because Lawrence has been such a wonder and such an incredible addition to us as an agency and to the Juvenile Justice Committee and to YDO in general. But Lawrence, do you want me to tell them or will you tell them yourself? Uh, um, I'm I'll about to cry right now. I'll, I'll tell everyone. So um, it's with great, it's with great regret, regret, seriously, everyone, that um, that I have to inform everyone that um, I have um, been offered um, a federal position, um, and and I have um, accepted that position. Um, um, it's a uh, it's an equal opportunity specialist position, um, and it's a regional position, um, which allows me to, um, you know, travel the uh, the the eleven western states, um, and it's not. And it's not something that I took lightly. Um, um, there's some family situation, situation stuff that that's happening um, with my myself and my spouse. So, um, so it um, it 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 helps that situation tremendously um, to be be able to be enrolled like that um, and, and have that um, um, availability to to possibly relocate. Um, so um, I just want to thank everyone for all the help and. And, and sincere um, assistance that you've, you've provided me, the, the the welcoming that you presented to me. Um, I know my time here was short, but I hope I made some sort of an impact, a positive impact. Um, all of you will be sorely missed. Um, and um, and this is very bittersweet for me. Um, I'm, I'm not running away. I'm, I'm slowly, slowly dragging my feet in the other direction. So um, because I've had such a wonderful time here and just being a part of this, um, this work has just been phenomenal. Wow. Congratulations. Um, and um, personally, I'm really going to miss you. You have really um, been just a great driver of discussions. And um, I'm just going to hold on to the congratulations. Let's just drop it there for right now. <laughs> uh, 
Thank yeah, you. the impact and the um, the message and the movement for the last year has been amazing. So thank you, thank you, and good luck on whatever you whatever your next federal role is. Congratulations. Thank you, Molly. I appreciate that. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. Well, can I just jump in and say, yeah, Mark, <laughs> thank you to Anya's point and everybody else's. You've been fantastic. I, yeah. I am super happy to have gotten to know you a little bit better and to work with you and your ability to develop relationships with many juvenile justice professionals, whether directors or other staff in such a short amount of time, I mean, was essential as we were coming out of COVID. And um, you're just, you made a big impact and your understanding as demonstrated of, of the, as demonstrated by this presentation of the system and of this data and the nuance. I, I mean, the juvenile system can be complicated <laughs> And and the understanding decision points and what these the, the the meaning of the data and where the opportunities are where the challenges are doesn't necessarily come easy. And you're what six eight months in? What is it? You know. And I know you've had some background, so we saw that, and we're just have been so happy with with everything you've done. So we wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, well, that's an interesting shift over now to the rest of the agenda. <laughs> um, so I we have six minutes left, five minutes left. Um, and I want to uh, give uh, Anya the 2021 and 2022 potential subgrant awards. Do we have much for that? Yeah, well, it's not going to take long. It will take a few seconds. So uh, we've been still waiting from procurement services to work on the RFA for these funds. And what occurred to us was that there were a few applications from juvenile justice related agencies that came for other YDC, YDO grants, and they were not awarded. So Lauren's, um, has taken the lead in looking at those quote unquote, well, I shouldn't say even, I don't want to use the word rejected applications, but those that did not score high enough to get awards, but they might fit with the criteria of juvenile justice funding and the priorities that we have identified for 21 and 22 funds that are currently available. So basically what we're working on, identifying what they are, and then once we, we got a sense of uh, what type of programs are being proposed and reaching out to these entities and asking them if they would be willing to succumb to federal reporting, this can sometimes be a bit of a work, but it's worth it. So anyway, so that's where we are with the 21 and 22 funding, and I hope that's, that does not create uh, too big of a problem for the committee. And we will let you know who those potential um, entities are. And I know, Lawrence, you want to say a couple of words because we'll, we'll, you've been the, the, the main lead on that, but there are some different areas of the state that we would like to consider, like Eastern Oregon, Central Oregon, the Valley area pretty much covers the state. So that's our update on that. Um, okay. Um, it, so maybe by the next meeting we'll have that? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so the last piece, the detention guidelines and extended detention, I'm just putting on, on everybody's dashboard that it's coming back up, coming back around, and um, that we're gonna need to start taking a look at those uh, extended detention requests are to be reviewed by this committee and made recommendations to the council 
Um, and so hopefully maybe looking at March, our March meeting um, to have that done, but that feels like it might be a distance out, but it will be pretty fast. And so um, at our next meeting, we'll talk about maybe what that process looks like. And then Sam, do you have something that you would like to share with us? Sure, and it'll be real quick. I know we're short on time. Um, House Bill, you know, 2767, which created or established recovery schools. Originally, it was going to come to our unit. We were to build, we did a stuff on that. Um, but um, I do, we just got word over the weekend or Friday that uh, most likely it'll go to a different unit within ODE. So, um, yeah, so I, um, so I won't be doing the RFPs. I won't be sending the emails. It'll be a different way. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not coming to our unit. But it will stay in ODE, it won't go to OHA? No, 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 yeah, it'll be with ODE. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is, um, yeah, it'll be with ODE, yeah. Okay. Any other business for the good of the order, Anya? Oh, just, just, just very briefly. So, so Lawrence has been working on the RED data and the plan. But also Lindsay has been working on compliance data that is also due in second part of August, as well as the overall application for funding. So Lindsay, are you finding any potential challenges? Are we likely to be in compliance with the act or is there anything that we need to be aware of? Uh... Okay, well, I feel more comfortable doing this this year since I'm this is my second time and I'm a little over a year now. Um, we do Oregon does have uh seven gel removal violations, um because you know police departments were having kids over six hours, so I had to report that. Um, I'm still working on the data. I met with my compliance monitor in Nevada for a little bit of help last week. Um, but yeah, I I am confident that that is the only violation violation set that we have for Oregon and I am looking forward to submitting it by its due date um this month and yeah um just been working on that and I did I've been doing a ton of inspections this year um I did just finish up with the Clackamas County Intake Center thank you Christina for helping me set that up Kelly Russell was so great super knowledgeable um, very informative, and it was great to meet her and and see that tour. So, uh, getting things done, and it's it's great work. Thank you, guys. Okay, so is gel removal one of those? If you have one violation, you're out, or is it a percentage? I I think it's a percentage. Um, because I'm so new. Um, they do state by state, so it's not like one state's the same percentage as all because we all have different. Uh, percentages. Uh, but I will tell you that Oregon is not the only one facing jail removal violations. There's a lot of other states. Um, Illinois is one. They have a lot right now. Um, yeah, it's just hard to get kids in and out within six hours. So, and the feds know they need to know. Um, so they're looking into what maybe we can do going forward. So we'll keep okay. you updated as I hear more. Okay. Anything else for the good of the order? I know, Lindsay, if there's any ever, if you ever have any challenges on getting into a police department or sheriff's office, you know you have a team behind you that you could just call on us locally. We'd be help, glad to help you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, so last piece is the first Monday is seeming to be a difficult meeting time for a lot of people. And so um, I think we may end up having to do a little bit of a, a check in with everybody to see what a standing committee would be um, to get our full committee kind of up and rolling again. So you may see a change in date and time um, or an email out asking what would be the best date and time. I don't, we don't have that set yet, but that may be something you'll see in your, in your inbox. And with that, I think we are done. Any final comments from the group? Good luck, Lawrence. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> we are adjourned. Good luck, Lawrence. Have 
you do great in your next federal position. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Lawrence. Thanks, everybody.